Super Mario Odyssey is filled with some of the best Mario levels ever designed. Levels like Steam Gardens, Fossil Falls, and New Donk City are all super iconic and fun levels to explore. Each of them are so full of content, which is what makes them what they are. And that's exactly why four of this game's kingdoms are significantly worse than the others. Those four are the Cloud Kingdom, the Ruin Kingdom, the Dark Side, and the Darker Side. All four of these kingdoms have one thing in common. They're all much smaller than the others, which is why I've decided to label them Mario Odyssey's Mini Kingdoms. Welcome to the second episode of Level by Level, a series where I analyze levels to see what works about them and what doesn't. In our first episode, we covered the Snow Kingdom, but this episode will be a bit different. Since all of these kingdoms are quite small, it'd be hard to make each of them their own video. This episode will act more as a comparison between each of them so we can figure out what's the best of them and which one is the worst. Before we get started though, I want to cover why we are covering these four specifically. In the previous episode, I showed how there are three kingdom sizes in Odyssey. The large kingdoms have 100 purple coins, the medium sized ones have 50, and the four we're talking about today don't have any. Besides us covering four kingdoms instead of just one, this video will be structured very similarly to the previous episode. We'll start with the kingdom's different looks and aesthetics, then we move on to its layout, afterwards we'll look at its story, followed by its captures, and then we end by taking a look at the kingdom's moons. We'll also determine which kingdom does which section the best and end the video with an overall look at all four. But anyways, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like and since only a small percentage of you are subscribed to the channel, I'd greatly appreciate it if you did that as well. The last episode of this series underperformed quite a bit, but I decided to keep it going regardless because I really enjoy making this series. But with that said, let's begin level by level episode 2 by taking a look at Mario Odyssey's 4 mini kingdoms to determine which is Super Mario Odyssey's worst kingdom. To begin, let's take a look at each kingdom's aesthetic. Mario Odyssey does a great job of making each of its main kingdoms distinct from Mario tropes. This lets each level have its own unique feel, even if it's based on things Mario has done before. Steam Gardens is a forest world, but it's infused with technology. Toastarina is a desert world, but the sand is red and is infused with ice. I could keep going for most kingdoms in the game, so how well do these four kingdoms do in that aspect? Well, starting off with Cloud, and yeah, this is the worst kingdom aesthetically in the game, no contest. This is Mario Odyssey's rendition of the trope of the Sky World. In other Mario games, this level trope will take place in the clouds, and that's exactly what this kingdom is like. Looks-wise, there's not much difference between Cloud Kingdom and, say, Wing Mario Over the Rainbow. Actually, I would argue that Wing Mario Over the Rainbow, along with pretty much all previous Sky Worlds, actually look better than the Cloud Kingdom. Mario's Sky Worlds are of course defined by being in the clouds, but they're also incredibly colorful. Taking New Super Mario Bros. U for example, the levels in World 7 use a multitude of different bright colors to make this world feel much more enjoyable. Of the Mario tropes, this might just be my favorite because colorful things are shockingly fun to look at. Cloud Kingdom, on the other hand, is basically what you get when you delete all of the color, which is what made the trope work. In this kingdom, almost every single object is white, with a few exceptions. The sky also isn't that bright blue, which is a major part of previous sky levels. It's more of a light pink yellow gradient. Additionally, the entire bottom of the map is covered in more clouds, making this kingdom even more boring to look at. Now, this may be a bit of a conspiracy theory here, but I personally feel that all of these changes were done in order to make this more distinct from the trope. Not only did it not really work, the kingdom is worse for it. Sometimes, it's not better to be unique. While this kingdom would have still been low on the list had it maintained the colorful nature of the levels before it, I certainly wouldn't dislike it as much as I do. Is this technically more original than Wing Mario Over the Rainbow? I guess so, but I still think the latter looks significantly better. Gameplay-wise though, don't get me wrong, that level still sucks. Aside from just looks, there's also music, which this kingdom does not really have, so great. Really quickly before we move on though, I just want to say that the 2D cube sub area looks really nice and has a super fun spacey vibe. It's completely separate from the rest of the kingdom, so it's hard to give it points for this, but I like it a lot. With Cloud Kingdom covered, let's jump right into Ruined Kingdom. In stark contrast to the Cloud Kingdom, the Ruined Kingdom has one of the best settings aesthetically in the entire game and even the Mario franchise. Unlike most of the kingdoms in the game, this is entirely separate from any Mario trope. It said that a great battle took place here, and that's why the area is left in such disrepair. Claw marks from the dragon and the swords of previous people line the way up to the arena. The dark gray and purple colors of the kingdom also greatly add to this dark and gloomy aesthetic. I absolutely love how they did all the ruins here with how broken apart the walkway and the central tower are. Skipping ahead a little, while this kingdom also doesn't have any background music, it is filled with the squeaks of bats, which I feel work much better. It helps make the kingdom feel more ominous and also sell the sense of whoever used to live here doesn't anymore. 
The way the dragon's wings also stick out from the tower just boosts this kingdom to legendary status. We'll of course get to the dragon later, but I think it's important to say that his incredibly unique design from any other Mario boss fits here perfectly. I actually think that's a great way to describe this whole kingdom. It doesn't feel like somewhere Mario would go, but that's what makes it great. I've also always been a huge fan of purple when it comes to effects like the fog here. Mewtwo and Ganondorf also use purple effects in Smash Ultimate, and I think their effects look like some of the best in the game. The only complaint I and many others have about this kingdom's aesthetic is that it was wasted on such a small area. I'm sure everyone wishes we could explore the ruins of this kingdom more because it just has such a unique feel. This is essentially only a boss arena. Granted, it's an incredible boss, but it just did not deserve to be so small. This kingdom has so much wasted potential. Of all the many kingdoms, this should have at least been a medium-sized one. While I do hope Mario Odyssey 2 is composed of mostly unique kingdoms, I'm sure everyone would be fine with this one getting a second chance there. Well, hold on, let's slow down. Let's actually get Mario Odyssey 2 announced first before we start begging for what should be in it. Before moving on, I also really like how they made this sub-area unique, but still fitting in with this kingdom. It's still obviously part of the Ruined Kingdom, but the colors are slightly changed to lean more towards brown than purple. There's also a dark, tar-like liquid at the bottom of this area, which isn't seen anywhere else in the game. That just goes to show how much wasted potential this aesthetic theme had. But yes, this kingdom is by far the best looks of the many kingdoms, but we do have two more to look at, so let's go ahead and jump into those really quick. Our last two kingdoms, Dark and Darker Side, both mostly reuse the Moon Kingdom's aesthetic. Now right off the bat, I'm sure many of you are questioning why that'd make these better than Cloud Kingdom, despite these just being ripoffs. Well, for starters, these do just look better in my opinion, as a mix of black and light gray looks a lot better than just the pure, blinding white of Cloud Kingdom. Secondly, complaining about these kingdoms' looks would be like complaining about how Lucina or Dark Pit don't have incredibly unique movesets like other fighters in Smash. This was done to save on development, as they're just extras. It was either we get a moon ripoff or no kingdom at all, so I'm perfectly fine with how these kingdoms look. Also, I'm sorry for all the Smash comparisons today, I've been playing a lot of that lately. And for $5.99, you can be like me. It would be a bit of a disservice to call these pure ripoffs though, because they actually do a decent amount to make them distinct from the Moon Kingdom. Darkseid is filled with grayed out foods and is also populated by rabbits. This is a small touch, but it's enough to make this kingdom be at least a little distinct, which I greatly appreciate. Darkseid's boss rooms also have a completely different look from anything in the Moon Kingdom. By simply adding in the Lost Kingdom's poison to the bottom of the rooms, it makes the area have a much different feel. It doesn't really change anything gameplay-wise unless you're a complete idiot, so this change was purely made to make this stand out, which it does a great job of. Darkseid also has several sub-areas, but since these are all lifted from sub-areas we've seen before, this kingdom won't get any credit for them. Darker Side also does a great job mixing up the Moon Kingdom. For starters, the outside is populated by all the people Mario has met on his journey having a concert. Water is even placed so Dory could be here as well. They're all listening to Jump Up Superstar, which is obviously the game's most iconic song, and it serves the Darker Side perfectly. This kingdom is the last one you unlock, and is supposed to be one final major challenge for the game, which is also meant to send you on a nostalgia trip through everything you've seen. Of course Jump Up Superstar had to be here, but several of the game's iconic tracks play while you do this challenging gauntlet. The outside of both of these kingdoms play Honeyloot Ridge, which of course fits well because they all take place on the moon, but once you go inside the main area here, Fossil Falls starts playing. Afterwards, you get to listen to Toast Arena Ruins, Steam Gardens, Forgotten Isle 2, Mount Vobono, Bowser's Castle 1, and the Underground Moon Caves, which all help sell this nostalgia trip perfectly. One last aesthetic thing here. While many of the assets in the underground section are taken from the Moon Kingdom's cave, there's an important distinction made here, and that has to do with the color of the sky. Many people may not notice, but instead of having the Moon Caves orange sky, this area starts off with a bright blue. Notice how I said starts, though, as the sky will actually shift colors as you go along, turning into multiple different colors before ending in a bright, victorious yellow. The second area with the fog is also a nice change up in looks. I'm going to cover this area much more in depth in the story section, but aesthetic-wise, these two do a great job of being distinct while simultaneously reusing many assets from their parent Moon Kingdom. As a quick ranking in this category, Cloud was easily the worst, and then there's a big gap to Dark Side, followed closely by Darker Side before another big gap to Ruined Kingdom. But with the aesthetics covered, let's jump right into the layout of each of these kingdoms. Now the last section was incredibly long, but this is where them being mini kingdoms is really going to help me out, as there isn't too much to discuss here layout-wise. Just like its looks, Core and King- wait. Just like its looks, Cloud Kingdom's layout is incredibly dull. This kingdom's purpose is to be a boss arena for the first fight with Bowser, and while sure it does that really well, it's just kind of a big circle after that. It's really just a big circle with areas off to the side for one moon each. This kingdom goes against Mario Odyssey's whole theme of exploring due to there really being nothing to look at. With how symmetrical the main area is as well, it can kind of be annoying to find the moons that are on a specific platform as they all mostly look the same, so layout-wise, I'm not a fan. 
Ruined is a bit better in this regard. This one is separated into two areas, one where the player starts and they can cross over to the boss arena using the spark pylon. While being fairly linear, this starting area does have a decent amount to explore with a small area off to the side to get the moon rock and a hidden chest with the moon in it. There's also plenty of swords to pull out with Cappy and torches to put out. Let me just say though that this lead up to the boss arena is so much better than Cloud's. Cloud Kingdom just places Mario in front of three Cap Cloud platforms where he just has to roll up to Bowser. Here though, it's an ominous walk up to the Spark Pylon filled with ruins of the previous battle I mentioned before. Requiring the player to pull out the sword to get the Spark Pylon is also such a smart move for so many reasons. For one, it fits the atmosphere incredibly well. Pulling out a sword from a pedestal is a really common idea which matches this kingdom perfectly and it's fun to do it using Cappy. Not only does it build atmosphere though, but it also has a super smart gameplay use as well. During the ruined boss fight, you have to pull swords out from the dragon's head. Pulling it out before the player even reaches the boss teaches the player what these swords do so that they aren't confused during the battle. Speaking of the dragon, I really like how you can climb on it and explore it after the fight. I also like how it flinches if you throw Cappy at its eyes, it's such a neat detail. I do have some criticisms for the dragon though, like for one, his collision can be really wonky at times. There are several spots where you can just go straight through him. My bigger issue though is that I really wish they didn't make Mario slide down him so much so that you could actually go and explore its wings. I think it would be really fun to get a moon going on his wings. Maybe there could be a note moon where Mario has to go from one wing to the other. I just sort of feel like this was a bit of a missed opportunity. Another one is not letting Mario climb around the central tower. It's unfortunately just a giant collision box, so even if you think you can get up, you'll just bonk and fall down. You can't even climb around the edges since they don't have any collision. This is very unlike Mario Odyssey, which usually lets you explore everywhere, so it's a bit disappointing we can't explore here. Those are super minor complaints though, for being a mini kingdom, Ruin definitely works really well. The lead up and the arena itself are both done much better than Cloud at least. The dark side is split up into three different sections, one starting area, another central hub containing the paintings in most of the sub areas, and finally the Rabbit Ridge Tower itself, which houses the boss rush. I think this format works really well for this mini kingdom. Starting off, I really enjoy how you don't have to use the spark pylon to get from the first area to the second. Metro Kingdom has its hilariously named impossible jump where you ignore the spark pylon, but the one here is a bit more difficult. I always do it when I come around here, it's really fun, not too difficult, but not too easy either. The next thing I really like is how you have to look around the second island to find all of the different paintings and sub areas. They could have easily just lined them all up next to each other, but they added just that little bit of exploration. I also think it's nice that one sub area is on the starting platform, giving the starting area a bit more purpose along with rewarding exploration more. The tower itself is nothing too special, just a bunch of rooms where you have to go in between them by running in a circle. One thing I will comment on is that I greatly appreciate that after you beat the boss rush, an extra spark pile on is spawned so you can jump straight to the robo brood fight if you like. Also, a really funny detail about this spark pylon, they don't actually stop its hitbox at the bottom of the pole, so if you jump off and slide down until you'd hit where the pole would be, you can actually climb on nothing. This extends all the way down into the death barrier, and will even let you clip into the ground. I wouldn't call this glitch an issue at all because it's really fun to mess around with, so I'm happy it's here. One thing I do have a slight problem with personally though is the moon gravity. Since this does take place on the moon, both this kingdom and darker side have lower gravity. While this does make the kingdoms unique, it also makes it feel a bit slow for me. If this was just on the outside though, I wouldn't really have an issue. However, you also have the low gravity during the boss rush. Personally, I'd rather have normal gravity here because these bosses were clearly designed for it. Look at how much of a joke getting on the Robo Brood is in low gravity. It's not that big of a deal, it's just a personal gripe. And at least the low gravity does go away when you go into the sub areas. Other than that though, this kingdom's design works well for what it is. As a hub for several different challenges, it's pretty fun to explore, so I don't really have any major complaint. Mario Odyssey was so close to being a perfect video game. But then they had to include her. Let's move on before I freak out any further. Darker Side is less of a kingdom and more of a linear platforming challenge. I'm not going to talk about each challenge in depth before the story section, but just know that this kingdom does a good job of being linear. Even though it's just a point A to point B level, there's still quite a bit of Mario Odyssey secrets and shortcuts hidden within this level. In previous final challenge levels in Mario games, there really wasn't any way to skip any section. I mean, you could skip this clear pipe in 3D World, I guess, but that's really not a skip. 
Here, however, you could do that in several areas, all of which are actually intentional. The first example is here with the uproot. Instead of going down into this pathway full of water, you can actually use the uproot on this block to get up to this ledge with a bit of parkour. This rewards you with a big pile of coins and allows you to move straight to the Yoshi section without having to go through the cold water at all. You can also skip the section with the scarecrow by writing up the platform it's attached to. It's a bit difficult to do, but once you get it, you can get a heart up here and then move on to glide on. The final skip is the by far largest of them all, where you can actually use Glide On to skip over the entire rest of the level. If you shake the controller while gliding, Glide On will actually be able to glide much longer than he normally would be able to. This lets you go right over the forks and pipes straight to the Bowser section. Actually, that was a bit of a lie, because Glide On can actually skip over the Bowser painting entirely. If you shake the controller in just the right way, you're able to get just barely enough height to skip over it completely. Once you get up here, there's another pretty big stack of coins. I really appreciate these shortcuts as they're pretty fun to do and it's quite rewarding. It does make this level easier, but these aren't very obvious shortcuts at all. Most of the time, you would have only heard about these after beating the level. The game doesn't even tell you about shaking the controller to glide better, so it's really here for players doing repeat runs. In my opinion, that's great as it makes it more fun to go through multiple times. The final great thing about this level's layout is that there are several secret and optional areas. The first is right at the beginning where you can actually defeat this hat mini boss for a king heart. This is perfect for the beginning because it lets the player decide if they want to use their time to get a power up or if they'd want to just rush right in. The player wouldn't have taken any damage at this point yet. Again, unless they're garbage, but that does make this decision a little bit more interesting. It's sort of like deciding if you want to go back for a power up before challenging champions Road in 3D World. You never know how the attempt is going to go beforehand, so you might just end up wasting your time, which I personally find really interesting. There are several hearts hidden around the level that are somewhat risky to go for. There's a Sphinx halfway through the level during the Steam Gardens portion, which has a ton of questions about the game. It's completely optional, but if the player decides to answer them all, then they're rewarded with another King Heart and a gigantic pile of coins. The final coin stack is behind the grayed out New Donk City Hall. This pile is incredibly tall, so it's super satisfying to jump and fall onto all of them. So despite being just a linear level, this design and layout makes it fit perfectly within Mario Odyssey's open design. It is easier than previous big challenge levels like Champions Road, but I find this one to be better. We'll get more into it in the next section, but I think this one may be the best designed of all of the mini kingdoms. If I were to rank them, I'd put Cloud in last place again, with a big gap separating it and third place being Dark Side. Then we have Ruined as the runner-up, with Darker Side taking this category with first place. With the design and layouts covered, let's take a look at their stories. While these four are mini kingdoms, they do still have main storylines. This is an important part of any kingdom as it usually contains the most distinct moons and moments. As these kingdoms are small, so are their main stories with each only containing one mission. Let's start out with Cloud Kingdom's story. After completing either Wooded or Lake Kingdom, Mario and Cappy set their sights for the Metro Kingdom. Before they can get there though, they run into the King of Dakupas himself, Bowser. A cutscene plays, but then it sort of abruptly switches to the Cloud Kingdom. From there, Mario has to go and fight Bowser for the first time. I definitely think it's good to fight Bowser at least once before the final fight. It establishes him as the main villain. If he just popped up at the start and end, I think that'd make him slightly less interesting. The midpoint is a great place to do this. The other 3D Marios I feel make you fight Bowser a bit too much or a bit too early. Mario 64 and Mario Galaxy make you fight him three total times, which I personally think is a bit too much, at least for how long those games are. The original New Super Mario Bros. makes you fight Bowser at the very beginning, which just makes him feel like not the main villain. Though I guess you could argue that Bowser Jr. was the main villain of that game. Anyways, the concept of having this main boss fight here works well. The fight itself is also really good. Generally, the Bowser fights in Mario games are pretty solid and this is no exception. Mario has to catch Bowser's hat with Cappy and then punch Bowser back with it. This is simple, sure, but it still has a lot of complexity that I appreciate. Normally, after catching his cap, Bowser will jump away and start throwing stuff at Mario. If you're able to time it right, though, you can actually punch him before he jumps. That way, there's some added difficulty in trying to do this fast. Mario Odyssey was designed to have many different routes to do challenges faster, so implementing fast routes into their bosses was such a great move in selling this idea. It adds more depth without affecting players that want to play the game normally. It's those simple little things that I really appreciate about this game. One last thing about this boss itself is that its background theme is really good. I personally prefer it to the final Bowser theme. I like this new generation of music. After Mario defeats Bowser, we get treated to a really nice cutscene at Bowser's airship firing at Mario and Cappy, which leads them smoothly into the Lost Kingdom. I like how this leaves the Odyssey broken up for a while afterwards as well. Overall, I think the story is the first piece of credit I can actually give to the Cloud Kingdom. While it is short, it fits nicely into the game overall, and plus I'd rather be out of this kingdom sooner rather than later. 
The cutscenes are also a big plus here. This kingdom's story overall is pretty good. Road Kingdom's story is actually pretty similar to Cloud's. After completing Luncheon Kingdom, Mario and Cappy set their sights for Bowser's kingdom. This time though, instead of just running into Bowser, he was waiting for them. Not on his airship, but on the Lord of Lightning himself. This cutscene is one of the best in the game. Instead of just cutting to Cloud Kingdom like the last one did, this one shows Bowser commanding the dragon to straight up kill Mario. I mean, that line of dialogue sure makes it seem like that's what Bowser was trying to do. After our two heroes fall into the abyss, Bowser flies away, which then brings us to the Kingdom cutscene. I loved how much better this one flowed between scenes. The last one was just a bit too abrupt. Mario is now in the Ruined Kingdom where he has to take a walk up to fight the Ruined Dragon. Aesthetically, this is the best fight in the game, no contest. The Ruined Dragon is super intimidating, especially after already knocking Mario and Cappy here in the cutscene prior. This boss fight is also a ton of fun. He shoots out these rings of lightning which roll around the arena before slamming his head into the floor causing electric shockwaves which form in different shapes each time. I know I might be bad at video games, but these attacks aren't the easiest things to dodge. I still even get hit by them from time to time. To be fair, that might just be because I'm greedy though. Once his shockwaves are over, Mario can climb on his head where he has to pull out the swords like I mentioned earlier. If he's able to do that in time, he can ground pound on this spot on the dragon's head. Do that three times and the boss is defeated. Wait, I kind of forgot to mention he also spawns these purple guys, but I genuinely don't think I've ever been hit by them once. This fight is a ton of fun, even though there really aren't any speedrun tricks here. I mean, you can damage boost to pull the swords out a slight tiny bit earlier, but I wouldn't really call that one on the same level as some of the other skips. Still though, this is one of my favorite bosses regardless, it doesn't need to have skips. Plus, pulling the swords out in the fastest way possible already gives you the feeling of going fast. Unlike in Cloud, Mario is actually awarded a multi-moon and then he just flies off the Bowsers. It's slightly said that there's no cutscene, but there really didn't need to be. Just like Cloud, this kingdom's story is great and fits perfectly into the game. I do slightly prefer Ruin though, just because that opening cutscene is incredible and the boss fight here is also a bit better. I wouldn't bully anyone for thinking Cloud is a better story though, they're both pretty close. Our first two kingdoms both played into the main game story, however both Dark and Darker Side are post-game kingdoms. In order to reach the Dark Side, you have to collect 250 total Power Moons, which is 126 more than the required amount to beat the game. This kingdom story acts as a boss rush where you have to defeat each of the Brutals without any heart refills. They're all the same as their second boss fights, or for each individually, Topper and Harriet's Bowser Kingdom fight, Spewart's Luncheon fight, and Rango's Snow Kingdom fight. The only difference is that the kingdom is in low gravity, which as I mentioned, I'm personally not a terribly huge fan of. Unlike most rematches, I prefer all of the Brutal's earlier renditions without the low gravity. I'm sure the gravity was changed to make them more unique, but I'd rather just have a normal boss rush, honestly. Some of them become more annoying, and Rango just becomes a complete joke. After defeating all four of them, though, you get an extra heart to defeat the Robo Brew, which is my personal favorite boss in the game. You're supposed to use Hammer Bros to destroy their legs instead of Pokios, but you could just... Yeah, this boss fight here is way too easy in comparison to the quite difficult version in Bowser's Kingdom. After defeating the Robo Brood one last time, Mario and Cappy get a multi-moon and they're rewarded with the King's Outfit. While not really my favorite in the game, it's a decent reward. While I am happy about having a boss rush in the game, I feel that this kingdom executed it a bit poorly. Of the four, this kingdom's story is certainly the weakest. It really did just come down to the low gravity. I personally feel like it hurt this kingdom way more than it helped it. And now we've reached the darker side. Unlike every other kingdom in the game, the story is the only moon present here. As I stated before, this acts as the game's final challenging gauntlet, being awarded to players after getting 500 moons. First off, I think it's an interesting idea to reward this to players this early. I mean, 500 moons is a lot of course, but all of the other 3D Mario games that have super hard challenges at the end require the player to collect everything to unlock it. I think Odyssey's approach is great as it lets players that don't want to spend a ton of time 100%ing the game see a great ending. I also appreciate being able to buy moons as it made getting footage for this video a lot easier. Anyways, there's a super great video on the topic of Mario Odyssey's multiple endings, so I'll have that linked in the description. It's a great watch. Getting into the level itself, Mario briefly spends time on the surface where a concert is incurring to set the mood. Then Mario has to capture a frog in order to jump up into the pipe. I just want to say that I'm super happy that when you die in this level, you respawn after the pipe since the frog bit is a bit slow and tedious. Now that we're actually in the level here, Mario is faced with a large pack of Goombas, which we mentioned before he could either use to defeat the boss, or just move on. Then he enters a 2D section, not pixelated, just straightforward, where he has to jump between multiple poles. 
As this is the first real challenge, it's fairly easy. I also appreciate how you can just jump over most of the poles so that you don't even have to wait for the cycles to line up. With this being a hard level, players are going to be playing the beginning over and over again, so you definitely want to avoid requiring the player to wait too much. Mario then has a long jump between moving bombs, which isn't difficult in any way, but I find it quite enjoyable to do. The level then starts to ramp up in difficulty, where Mario now has to use the lava bubbles to avoid getting hit by these moon snakes. If you aren't patient, you could very easily get hit here. It's a simple test of the lava bubble, but a fun one regardless. I also really like how all the snakes line up, it's sort of fun to watch. Afterwards though, we then move on to the cannon for the next section. After getting launched, the music and sky changes with it now playing Toast Arena Ruins. Darker Side acts as a nostalgia trip through each of the previous kingdoms of the game, so this music change is a very important part of that. This next section lets you use an uproot to get through the platforms. Uproots are one of the most fun captures in the game, so I had to be here, though it's also fun to ignore it and just go through this area without it. The frozen water segment, in my opinion, isn't that great because it's a bit slow, but you can skip it with the trick I said earlier, which I appreciate. Following this is a section where you get to use Yoshi to avoid more fuzzies on conveyor belts. This is a great way to use Yoshi's wall sticking ability with his tongue, which really wasn't used enough in the game. This leads to the Steam Garden segment with the Flower Path. Just like the Lava Bubble section, there are separate areas off to the side in order to get some extra hearts. One of them is actually pretty difficult to get, so I really appreciate having that extra challenge. Then there's a fun Scarecrow segment before getting into the Glide with Glideon, which plays Forgotten Isle 2. I definitely think Glideon was an important capture to include to represent the Lost Kingdom, but I think this segment is just way too easy. The Nats aren't difficult to avoid at all, I really wish they came up with a more unique and difficult gliding course. Maybe you could have to do multiple turns and avoid different obstacles, but the way they have it now is pretty lame. Regardless, we then jump into the Luncheon segment, which uses the Forks as a lead-up to the Bowser Kingdom segment. Entering into the pipe, we found ourselves in easily the most difficult part of the level. It starts on a slow auto-scroller, which is meant to test your patience with taking out these rainbow guys. You always have the thing in the center to create a ring and kill them all, however, if you do it, then it will constantly activate others on the edges, possibly making this section even more difficult. It's pretty hard to try to kill the rainbow guys without hitting the switch, so this section is actually a pretty cool one for being an auto-scroller. Then there's a very good use of the Pokios, where you have to time its flick on these moving Bowser platforms. Since this is over the void, if you mess up once, then you have to restart the entire level. I appreciate the added intensity, because there's really no other place like that in this level. Afterwards, there's a pixelated 2D section, which obviously had to be in this final level, and it's a showdown with Donkey Kong to also represent New Donk City and its iconic festival mood. Personally, I'm not a fan. For one, it messes around with the different perspectives, and much like the Galaxy games, this butchers Mario's controls and often makes him go in the opposite direction of what I want. Secondly, while Bowser's Castle 1 is a great song, its 2D variant actually hurts my ears. It's easily my least favorite song on the soundtrack. That's why it's even more baffling how you all let it beat the Shavarian race course theme in the music tournament. Seriously, what is wrong with you guys? Forget only a small percentage of you are subscribed, apparently only a small percentage of you are based. Anyways, I would have changed this section up a bit. Definitely still keep Donkey Kong, but I would just change the layout. The final section has Mario take over Bowser himself in one last run to the end. It's not particularly hard by itself, but it was a good thing to include. I think this stretch goes on for a bit too long because you have to keep turning back to stop the ball from hitting you, but overall it's good. To finish the level, Mario takes control of a spark pylon to spell out thank you, just like many previous big levels before it. However, it doesn't end there. While the challenge of the level is pretty much done, there is still one more thing you have to do. Mario has to take control of the frog again, the first capture of the game and climb up a grade version of the New Donk City Hall. The Honeyloom Ridge theme works perfectly here, as it settles in how there isn't any more intense challenges to do. It's time to calm down. Mario climbs the tower using the frog's massive jumps and then the best part of the level. Cabby begins to give his speech. He reminisces about the game and all the adventures you had along the way to get to this point. Eventually, Mario makes it to the top, where all Mario has to do is climb up to the moon resting on the top of the tower, much like the one in New Donk City. This time though, the pull is a little bit longer. As Mario begins to climb higher, a music box starts to play which fills the player with nostalgia as Cappy's speech continues. Everything he says hits perfectly as he thanks you for taking him on this journey. Eventually, you reach the top, and all there's left to do is to hit the jump button and collect the moon. The music has completely gone at this point, and the stage is just silent with you face to face with the moon. 
Once Mario finally jumps, the quiet of the stage quickly turns into the victory theme of the moon, and it hits perfectly in this section as the long journey finally comes to an end. This is one of my favorite sections of any video game. Every single time the music box kicks in, I get hit with such a strong wave of nostalgia that no other game has really been able to replicate for me. Sure, Darker Side doesn't have any real cutscenes like Cloud or Ruined, but this moment alone makes this whole kingdom worth it. They could have just ended it after the thank you, like most other very hard Mario levels, but they went that extra mile to give the player a place to let their accomplishment really sink in. The level itself is also solid, it's pretty difficult with all the sections placed together, but I really think that ending is what puts this above the others. Having just a little bit to let your accomplishments sink in sells this level so well. Not to mention that you also get the invisibility cap for completing this level, which is a really really good reward as it lets you challenge yourself to do more moons using it. And also, Pauline gets Mario's cap over here, which I also think is a funny little detail. I hesitate to call this the best Kingdom story in Odyssey, but it's up there. They really knocked this out of the park with that ending. This segment here will easily be the shortest as, well, these kingdoms don't really have many captures like the others. Most of the other kingdoms have one or two main captures that can be used to explore them. Here though, that's not really the case. Understandably, they probably didn't want to program captures for these mini kingdoms that you'd only be at for a short time. In Cloud Kingdom, there are only two captures, Picture Match Part Goomba and Picture Match Part Mario. These work perfectly for the Picture Match minigame, but shocker, they aren't used outside of the minigame at all. Also, they definitely could have put these under the same category, like the different letters in New Dong City instead of splitting them up, but it doesn't really matter. Either way, they serve their purpose well. Well, actually, I sort of lied to you. For some reason, the Mario parts don't count for the capture here. Yeah, don't ask me why, but I think that's kind of weird. Ruin Kingdom has three captures, the Spark Pylon, the Mini Rocket, and the Charge and Chuck. The first two are purely to transition between areas in this kingdom, so they do a good job of that. The Charge and Chuck is used for some sub-area moons. This is an incredibly underused capture because its first appearance is in the Moon Cave at the end of the game. I like running around with them and ramming through whatever blocks its way, even if the sub-area it's in does not really fit with the Ruin Kingdom at all. Dark Side is where we start to get some more captures, with a whopping five of them being the Spark Pylon, Binoculars, Hammer Bro, Yoshi, and Sherm. The Spark Pylon again just acts as a way to get from one place to another, and the Binoculars are used to look at things, so they're both fine captures. The other three are a bit more interesting. The Hammer Bros are used in the fight with the Robo Brood at the end of the boss rush. While I appreciate them trying to make this fight more unique by using a different capture from the Pokio, you can again just easily ignore them due to the moon's gravity. As for the Hammer Bros themselves, I mean, it's fine, but the way they only hop around was always weird to me. Also, throwing the hammers does work in this specific case, but in some other areas, using the hammers is a bit of a pain since it's based on randomness and it's hard to throw them exactly where you want. The Sherm is used in the sub-area based on the one in New Donk City. In the original, you have to use them in order to find moon shards, but in this sub-area, you have to use Yoshi to eat fruit for the two moons. The Sherms are not needed to collect the moons here at all, but I think it's fun to include them anyways. They're more so here as obstacles to give the player something to actually try to avoid dying to. As for controlling them, the person you all call me a ripoff of made a solid video of why they aren't great, which I suggest watching. But just know that using them is a bit uncomfortable. The last capture is what I would consider this kingdom's main one, Yoshi. He is used for 6 of the 24 moons here in 3 different sub-areas. I really like controlling Yoshi, his flutter jump feels natural, but more importantly, his tongue control is great. Its main use is to grab fruits, and I really like how it can grab multiple at a time. If I had to keep pressing the tongue button over and over to eat each individual fruit, this would get very tiring, so I really, really, really like that you can grab more than one at once. Yoshi can also let his tongue stick to things. This can let Yoshi attach to walls or gain a lot of speed by doing it on the ground. He's one of the most fun captures to control due to just how much depth there is in his moveset. Also, before I get murdered in the comments, yes, the fire piranha plants, poison piranha plants, bullet bills, and bonsai bills all make an appearance in this kingdom. However, it's impossible to capture them here as far as I know. Darker Side has by far the most captures of all of the mini kingdoms at a total of 11. Those captures are the Binoculars, Frog, Goomba, Lava Bubble, Uproot, Yoshi, Glidon, Vobonin, Pokio, Bowser, and the Spark Pylon. Just like the last few, the Spark Pylon and Binoculars work well at their jobs. The other nine are all placed here as they're some of the most iconic captures of the game which would help sell the nostalgia theme much better. 
Frogs, of course, are the first capture. They give Mario a higher jump, which works great for the ending, but I personally do find them a bit tedious at the start. They just feel a bit too slow with moon gravity, so I'd rather the pipe had just been available without needing to use them. Goombas are the most popular Mario enemy, and they're common in most kingdoms, so it makes sense that they're here. They're only used for the optional mini-boss at the start, but that's a perfect place for them in my opinion, as it shows off their stacking quite well. Lava Bubbles were the main capture of the Luncheon Kingdom, which allowed you to move through lava, but not on land. Their built-in land restriction makes the challenge possible, which as I said, was a pretty fun one. Uproots were the main capture of the Wooded Kingdom, and they're just really fun. Stretching upwards to move platforms quickly to not take damage is a great use here. Having to time their stretch and hop afterwards for the shortcut was also a nice use of the capture. Yoshi is mainly used in Mushroom Kingdom and Dark Side, which we already went over. I like how you can use him on the Flower Road section if you'd like to use his Flutter Jump to your advantage. His wall clinging part is a bit slow for me, but it's nice to have a bit of a breather. Glideon is used in several kingdoms like Sand, Wooded, but I mostly associate him with being in Lost Kingdom. He's a lot of fun to glide with in the kingdoms he's used in, but here he's not great. He still definitely makes sense to be in this level with how often he's used in the game, I just wish he was used better. The Bulbonin, though, is a bit of a weird choice for me. We already had the Lava Bubble representing Luncheon, so I think it would have made much more sense for these to be the poles from New Donk City. We don't really have any capture from there, so I would have preferred that. Bench Friends there's a problem that infests and rots any game when there's a lot of copy and pasted content, especially in something close to a collectathon like Odyssey. Controls wise though, these work great. It's fun to flick Mario across the lava, and I like how there's an optional area for coin rings. Pokios, of course, represents Bowser's Kingdom, and I actually think this was one of their best uses in the entire game. Having to use them on moving platforms and, as I said, over the void makes it much more intense. Bowser of course ends the level with the ability to scratch and fireball, which controls great. But yeah, overall, Darker Side hits most of the game's biggest captures. The only ones I would say were missing would be the Chain Chomp, Bullet Bill, and Gushin. It's obviously unrealistic to expect all of them though, but it would have been nice to represent them, even if they were just maybe obstacles instead. Overall, in terms of captures, we can pretty much rank these kingdoms chronologically. Cloud is the worst selection, then it's Ruined, Runner-Up is Dark Side, and Darker Side easily takes this category. Originally, I was going to talk really in-depth about all of the moons in each of these kingdoms. But then I decided to write over 11 pages worth of script for everything else, so we're just going to quickly run through most of them. Moons are obviously a very important part of any kingdom, since they're usually the goals the player will be reaching for. Starting with Cloud, and this is actually the aspect I think it shines in the most. Moons numbers 1 and 7 are both for picture match. Mario has to assemble a picture of a Goomba as best as he can while the parts disappear. This is one of my favorite activities in the game. It's a lot of fun to put the Goomba together and try to get as close to the real thing as possible. It's also really funny when you accidentally make something cursed, or when you purposefully make something cursed. These two are easily the best moons in the kingdom. Moon number 2 is the standard peach moon in every kingdom, and moon number 3 is kind of annoying. You have to use the rumble feature to find it hidden in one of the platforms, and personally I hate where it's placed. It's not in the middle of the platform, it's sort of just placed randomly here, which really bugs me. Moon number 4 is a simple but fun platforming challenge. Personally, I like to try to do it while hitting as little of these cloud platforms as possible. Moon 5 is similar, though I like it more because it's actually possible to do it completely without these cloud platforms. It's pretty difficult, but with enough speed and a triple jump, you can cross over this gap to where the locked moon is. I always like when moons can be done in more challenging ways, as it gives more reason to come back to them later on. Moon 6 may be one of my favorite notes moons in the game. It takes place on a platform that rises upwards when ground pounded on. It's decently difficult and really fun to try and time when you throw Cappy, especially if you try to aim to do this with the least amount of uses of the platform as possible. I also greatly enjoy messing around with these ground pound platforms for some reason, so yeah, this one works great. Moons 8 and 9 take place in the 2D cube sub-area. I really like the cube gimmick, which isn't really used anywhere else but here. This is perfect for a moon shard moon since you can place one on each side and then the other side could be used for the bonus moon. They utilize this creative gimmick very well in my opinion, where you don't go through many pipes and you just fall to the next phase. The only exception is of course to get to the bonus moon, but that's not really an issue for me. In short, Cloud has great moons. Sure, it's not a lot, but most of them are pretty fun, so it makes the kingdom a little bit better than complete trash. Ruin Kingdom's moons are a little bit weaker, but still overall solid. We already went over moon number one in the story segment, so moon number two is a treasure chest moon. I really like how many ways there are to get this. You can go the intentional way of just ledge walking over, or you can jump from the top, or even take a longer jump to it. I also think having a hidden chest under the altar fits Ruin's theme very well. Moons three and four take place in Roulette Tower. While I did say I enjoyed the aesthetic, the moons themselves are average. 
The gimmick is unique where you have to stop these 2D platforms while in 3D, however I think it goes on for just a bit too long and it can be annoying when you mess up the last one of three since they all reset when you hit the switch. It is nice that you can do it without getting the platforms exactly right though, I do appreciate that. The hidden moon is kind of annoying though, due to needing to kick a Koopa shell over, and if it falls or somehow jumps out, you have to get it destroyed, which is pretty tedious. It is fun to jump from the top down to the second moon without the Koopa shell though, but it's not really obvious that you can actually do that. Moon 5 is the peach moon, so we'll move right on to moon 6, which is on the dragon. I'm happy that at least one moon takes place on the dragon, though again, I wish it was on the wings or something. Moon 7 is a good place to put the moon, though it is nothing special. Moon 8 is another moon rock. No, not that one, this moon rock. These are always super tedious, but only if you do it the normal way. Usually, there's a rock nearby, and if you run a moon rock into a normal rock, it will actually break instantly instead of taking like 50 throws. Interestingly, the extra rock is only placed here after activating the big moon rock, meaning that this was purposefully placed here to go with this moon. Moving on, moons 9 and 10 both take place in the Charging Chuck sub-area. As I said, he's really fun to control, so I have really no issues with this moon. Overall, these moons are solid, though there really aren't many standouts like in Cloud Kingdom. Darkseid has the most moons of the Mini Kingdoms, however, most of them have a theme. They're usually different versions of moons we've seen before, or hint art moons. Starting off, Moon 1 we already covered, so Moon 2 is just a normal Captain Toad moon. On the very serious and highly contested Captain Toad moon tier list, though, I think this one places pretty high. It's in a pretty obvious spot, though you might miss it the first time you pass it because of how nervous you may be to get here. It's also nice that there's that shortcut I mentioned earlier to get right to the spot if you missed him the first time around. Overall, very solid. Jumping into the remake moons, we have moons number 3 and 4 taking place on Breakdown Road. Well, in the original you had Cappy to help you, you're all alone this time. That actually makes this room significantly harder. The secondary moon is one of the hardest in the game where you have to perform several precise long jumps to lead back this bonsai bill. I really appreciate the new challenge here. These ones are great. Moons 5 and 6 take place on Invisible Road, which has the same no Cappy gimmick. This means there's no easy way to clear any of the poison, making this room again significantly more difficult. It's easier than the last moons for sure, but these are also great. Moons 7 and 8 take place on Vanishing Road and is actually something I really like the idea of. Yes, you again don't have Cappy here, but the main difference between this and the original is that you can no longer use the motorbike, meaning Mario is going to have to roll around at the speed of sound here. Just like his rival, Minecraft Sonic. I like this gimmick a lot because it's something that I and many others thought of doing in the original room, so seeing that you actually have to do it for a moon was really cool. The timer was extended from the original room due to how much slower Mario is than the bike, but this is still decently challenging, especially without Cappy to save you. It's still the easiest of the remake rooms so far, but its idea makes up for that. The rest of the remake moons, moons 9 through 14, are all based on Yoshi eating fruit hidden within sub-areas. I'm personally not a huge fan of them reusing this gimmick for 6 moons, but Yoshi is fun to control so that helps us a bit. Personally, I would just keep the 2 in the Magma Swamp and change the other 4 moons to something else. It's really fun to try and collect all of the fruit while on a timer, which is unlike any of the other fruit collecting missions. Also, fun fact about both this room and the original, you can actually get over to the islands in the distance. Using a King Heart and Cappy Bounces, you'll be able to make it over. The islands do look quite crusty, but it's a fun journey nonetheless. The other 10 moons, number 15 through 24, are all hint art moons. This type of moon is very controversial, as many people don't really like them. Personally, I find them to be fun puzzles and like them a decent amount, though I do think this was a bit much here. Quickly running through each of them, hint art 1 was easy to figure out what kingdom it was in, but kind of annoying to find the exact spot. Hint art 2 is pretty simple, but I like it. Hint Dart 3 is a bit too easy. I think it would have been much better if the purple coins weren't included as it points directly to Mushroom Kingdom and once you know that it's in that kingdom, there's really only one spot it can be. Hint Dart 4 is once again pretty easy but with Cloud's layout it can be kind of annoying to obtain. Hint Dart 5 is way too easy. Not only is it super obvious what kingdom it's in, there's also only one spot it could be there. Hint Dart 6 is fairly fun as it gives you enough hints but doesn't go too far. Hint Art 8 is different from most others, where it's actually a spot the difference puzzle. I always enjoy looking at these types of images, and they also could have easily butchered this by not having it be a side-by-side. -side. If they just made the Hint Art this, that would have been way too difficult, whereas doing the side-by-side -side makes it obvious it's a spot the difference without making it too easy. I'm a big fan of this one. Hint Art 9 is super obvious, but also not too hard. Solid Hint Art. And finally, Hint Art 10 is pretty obvious, but still solid nonetheless. Now I'm sure a lot of you noticed that I don't know how to count as I skipped over Hint Art 7. The reason I did that is because I just want to say, this one is pure evil. On my first playthrough, I thought this was the Red Sand of Sand Kingdom and was really confused when I could not find it. Here's my brother Luigi! Hello Mario! Then I realized that it was Lost Kingdom's ground, but I had no idea that the map has letters and numbers like this because why would anyone ever need to look at them besides doing this specific Hint Art? 
Seriously, these numbers and letters never come up once for the rest of the game. So yeah, this is in my opinion the hardest moon hint art. I don't dislike it though, I just personally find it very cruel. Overall, while this kingdom's highs reach higher than clouds, this kingdom's lows reach much lower. I don't like how repetitive this kingdom is, and while in isolation many of the hint arts work, there's just too many of them. I think bringing it down to say 5 instead of 10 would have helped since you spend a lot of time going back and forth to the Odyssey and flying to each kingdom. With that said, the moons here are overall still pretty good. I'm going to give Cloud the edge here though because it's definitely not as tedious. And also, Cloud needs at least one win in this video. And as for Darker Side's moons, well, it only has the one story mood, so let's go ahead and move on to our conclusion. With everything about these kingdoms finally laid out before us, which one is the worst, and which one is the best? Well, let's get the Albies one out of the way. Cloud Kingdom is easily the worst of the mini kingdoms, and is in turn the worst kingdom in Mario Odyssey. While its selection of moons is solid while having a good boss fight, its aesthetic and layout hurt this kingdom too much to justify putting it any higher than last place. Personally, I think Dark Side is next on the list. Like Cloud, it also has a solid selection of moons, but its looks are also solid this time around. The story, though, did bring this down since the low gravity affects the bosses in a way that doesn't really make them enjoyable for me. That leaves us with two, the incredibly creative and unique Ruin Kingdom and the linear nostalgia trip The Darker Side. While I wrote this video, I felt myself going back and forth a lot on this decision. In reality, these two are almost tied for me and I can easily understand either point of view here. In my personal opinion, though, Ruin Kingdom is slightly worse. Rune Kingdom's aesthetic far exceeds all the other three mini kingdoms, however, in almost every other aspect, Darker Side does it better. These kingdoms both serve very different purposes. One is a boss arena, while the other is a linear level. The biggest difference for me, though, is that Ruin feels more like a missed opportunity. Everywhere you look, people say that this should have been a full kingdom, and it does not feel complete. Darker Side, on the other hand, does not receive the same complaints, because it feels more complete. Ruined essentially baited people into thinking there would be a fun new area to explore, and while it was unique, there wasn't much to look at. Darker Side clearly shows that it was a one-and-done sort of deal. That way, players feel much more fulfilled when completing that rather than Ruined. While I'm incredibly happy that they gave Ruined such an amazing look, it almost feels as though we were cheated out of a much more interesting kingdom. Darker Side excels at being a linear level that still incorporates Mario Odyssey's exploration and optional routes. So in the end, my ranking goes as follows. Cloud Kingdom, Dark Side, Ruin Kingdom, and finally Darker Side takes this place as the best mini kingdom in Super Mario Odyssey. But anyways, that's it for episode 2 of Level by Level and apparently my longest video. I did not expect this to be that long, but knowing how much I like to talk about Odyssey, I probably should have. Did you all know that clouds exist in real life? Let me know in the comments. I would seriously appreciate it if you left a like on this video in particular. The last episode, as I said, performed terribly, and I really enjoyed making both episodes here. If this one does well, I'll try to make this series much more often. If not, I'll stick to only making these every six months or so. I also want to say I'm having a lot of fun editing the transitions for these videos, as I think they make the presentation feel much stronger. But if there's any more sort of editing suggestions you all have for me, then please make sure to let me know. Alright, this video is super long, so I think it's about time we end it. So anyways, dry bones for Smash, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.